Hi, this is the first episode of the whole series of interviews with interesting people from computer vision community. This one is with Robin Cole, a well-known author and open source contributor who publishes content about aerial and satellite image processing. I really enjoyed that conversation and I really hope that you will too. Hello, and uh, let's start make, maybe by you telling us uh, who you are and what do you do? So my name's Robin and I'm the creator of satelliteimagedeeplearning.com. And what I do is I publish material around working with satellite and aerial imagery using deep learning and machine learning techniques. I also author a very popular GitHub repository, which sort of collects information on these techniques. And I've also uh, published a few articles on the topic too. Okay, so I already have a few questions. First of all, because I am also quite involved in open source community. Uh, let's start with the GitHub repo. Um, so I never got to numbers uh, similar to yours. It's, I guess, mm. like around 5,000 stars, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, 5,000. Um, so um, coming from one open source developer to another, how much work is it? for you to maintain that repository? Now I'm not doing too much maintenance. Every now and again, I dip in. Like yesterday, I spent an hour on it just to basically try and change the formatting. Uh, in the past, I was doing a little bit very often. So I was doing like 10, 20 minutes a day. And that's how mm -hmm. like the content you know, mm -hmm. built up over time. And this is over a period of years. I originally started this repository about five years ago, literally when there was hardly any resources on the internet about the practicalities of doing deep learning with satellite imagery. I think there was like a dozen, right? So I had them in this repository. And over time, I noticed it started getting stars. And at some point it had like 200. And I thought, okay, this is this is looking popular. So I'll put more time and energy into that. And it became, you know, a matter of like personal pride to try and grow it. And in particular, there was like a couple of, in the remote sensing category, a couple of quite popular repositories that had like 2000 stars. And I was mm -hmm. like, I'm going to try and get to the top. I'm going to try, try and get more stars. <laughs> There's a little bit of like competitive, really, but you know, persistence pays off. And you've got to promote your work as well. Like if you just sort of leave it on GitHub, you know, it'll accumulate interest mm -hmm. over time. Mm -hmm. But I, I was posting updates on it on LinkedIn and Twitter, and that was, you know, having quite a big impact on the number of stars and there's quite a compounding effect you know once you've got a certain number of stars it validates you know the quality of the of the material where more people will go there so yeah it takes time takes takes work but i think the formula you know once you found a topic that people are interested interested in it's pretty straightforward yeah i guess in your case the finding the niche that was uh, unexploited first of all and second of mm -hmm. all, like you say, persistence and linking to that repository, there's a pro tip for others that would like to maybe create open source repository that is successful and your, uh, yours is. Uh, yeah, you cannot just leave it over there. You you need to create a lot of uh, bus and links into that repository, kind of like that's how it grows. Um, okay. Um, so obviously that repository and other things that you do are related to satellite uh, imaging but i don't know other person who is uh, you know involved in that particular niche as deeply as you so how is that happening like how how somebody finds uh, satellite images and decided okay i i that's something that i will do for for life right now mm. So my last couple of jobs have actually been working for companies that we were making satellites themselves or uh, mm -hmm. selling satellite imagery. So it obviously overlapped with what I was doing as a day job. And like the the repository, for example, it was useful to me, right? To just, if I, if I need to work on a particular topic, I could dive in and find all these uh, useful resources there. So it's something I was using in my work, right? So mm -hmm. that was, you know, a good reason to work on it. And like I say, I noticed the interest in it. In principle, so initially, the repository started as a kind of like personal notebook on stuff that you would like to read or learn about, and mm. that was the seat where it grows. That's right. I had a project I was working on. I was like, well, I need to, you know, list some useful references. I'll put them in a GitHub repository. And mm -hmm. actually, I've got like hundreds of GitHub repositories. I'll create them for things like, even if I've got like, you know, an interview coming up and I've got a few notes, I'll create a repository for it. 
you know, because you never know, like that is going to be useful at a later time. And I find that GitHub is quite a good place to centralize all my, all my documents. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah, that that's sort of grown over time. And, okay, so uh, so the source is work first, and later on that repository kind of like prepared you also into that direction, as I understand. Like the moment right. you started, you saw the success. You said, "Okay, let's let's go into that direction." That's right, and I think in general, I, I think like machine learning and deep learning is a growing topic, and I, I feel like that's a technology that's just going to turn everything on its head in the next decade. So mm -hmm. it's partly like a good way to you know, gain a reputation in an area of, of that uh, domain uh, by, you know, focusing on this niche. And I think that's quite a, a good way of getting getting a reputation established. Okay. I mean, like uh, 2022 was, in my opinion, yeah, year of computer vision and maybe deep learning, like in a broader term. Yeah, chat GPT, stable diffusion, all that stuff created a lot of buzz around uh, deep learning. So... Yeah, I, I expect that a lot of young people who are simply good at math will right now consider not only becoming like, you know, coders or programmers, but deep learning is the niche. Uh, I guess crypto was also <laughs> last year, but uh, right now everybody is coming back to deep learning. Um, okay, um, so what is so special? about uh, processing satellite images or aerial images that you need to create a whole repository with 5,000 stars with links to other resources. Like it seems uh, a lot of work to put that compendium together. So uh, why do we need one? Fundamentally, the world looks different from above, right? So if you've got like a data set of, you know, cars or people, you know, if you want to train a model to detect those things from mm -hmm. space or from a from a drone you're going to need a totally different data set and in particular it turns out that the, the the kind of images that are captured from those platforms can be quite different so we're used to like rgb images you know of a certain you know quality for example mm -hmm. like resolution and you know contrast when we take photos on our iphone right mm -hmm. but from an aerial platform you can have a much more diverse range of image sort of quality Right. So, you know, you might have a single channel image, for example, like captured from like a radar or a thermal platform, you know, mm -hmm. so you're already talking about a different number of channels. And typically the images uh, are larger, so they might have many more pixels in them. And typically they come in some sort of non-standard format. So by standard, I mean like JPEG or PNG, what we're used to working with in like deep learning sort of data sets or any machine learning image data sets. But when you get uh, a data set of, you know, satellite or aerial imagery, quite often it'll be in a different format and that will actually immediately create like different uh, sort of processes that you need to work with, you know, to use that imagery. So, you know, one particular format is the GeoTIFF, which is basically a TIFF with some special kind of metadata. But what you'll find is that most browsers will not display it, right? Cause it's a TIFF and they only display like JPEGs or, PNGs and also most software will, you know, like most like standard software will not necessarily open it in the right kind of way. So you can use like the Python library pillow to open TIFFs, for example, but then sometimes funny things like happen with, you know, the way data is encoded in the image. So they often, for example, use uh, NAND values to encode, encode missing data. And in area mm -hmm. images in particular, you can get an awful lot of these NAND values because of you know, the, the image might be taken at some sort of funny perspective and not actually be a rectangle, for mm -hmm. example. So there's different oh, okay. sort of okay. pre-processing steps just even to load and view uh, some of these uh, images from these platforms. Cool. I mean, I, I'm, I'm hearing about it and I'm thinking to myself, is it still computer vision if everything is so different? Uh... Uh, yeah. So at some point, you basically get the data into a more standard format so like a tensor right which is processed in some sort of way uh, so at some point in the process it becomes quite sort of standard computer vision but I would say there's different like um, sort of characteristics of modeling on aerial imagery so you know one of the issues is about for example in the context of object detection objects can be very small and an image completely dominated by background if you were talking about like looking for a car in an aerial image the sort of fraction of pixel pixels that you're going to get for that car is way different than if I'm walking down the road, you know, with my iPhone taking pictures there, the car is going to 
you know, be a substantial part of the image. So there's different characteristics and this can, you know, impact the performance of models trained on those uh, data sets and might, you know, require different ways of working with the data, mm -hmm. you know, for example, to ensure like a balanced data set. Uh, other aspects of the modeling process might differ, for example, like the augmentations you might apply to uh, an image would vary. So use, you know, usually from above, like an object can be at almost any angle in a 360 degree like rotation. Mm -hmm. So like those kind of rotational augmentations make a lot of sense, but you wouldn't necessarily, you know, rotate an image of a, a car on its head because it's not so common to, you know, see cars yeah, on, the sure, head sure. on the road. So I'm thinking to myself, like, uh, we use pretty standard formats. We use pretty standard data set, like, you know, in, in computer vision, uh, you know, the king is Coco, for example. This is something that is, doesn't really seem useful for you. Um, so, so how do you look for the data sets that you want to use for your project? Are there any open source initiatives, uh, something yeah. similar to Coco, for example? So yeah, Coco is like a benchmark data set and there are benchmark data sets in the remote sensing, uh, well, satellite and aerial imagery space. And, uh, I've got a, a list of those in a, a repository, of course, what I found mm -hmm. when I was looking years and years ago, there were benchmark mm -hmm. data sets, but somebody one might be like on Zenodo, one might be in a Google Drive somewhere, another might be on somebody's personal website and you'd have to like download it and unzip it. So actually originally my GitHub repository also included a big set of data mm -hmm. sets, although I've now split that out. Uh, so there are definitely, uh, you know, a large and growing number of, sort of benchmark data sets for remote sensing specific uh, tasks. Um, it looks like People are sort of standardizing on a couple of platforms. So Zenodo is one that's, you know, getting more popularity. Luckily, we're seeing fewer data sets in Google Drive because those links tend to tend to break. The data sets generally are quite large, so you're not going to see them like on GitHub, although some like previews mm -hmm. of data sets will be there. And of course, you know, a place like Kaggle will also host data sets, although it doesn't seem to have really won over the academic audience as a place to put their data sets. Okay. I mean, like I, I, I used to be pretty active on Kaggle and I haven't seen anything really over there. Uh, and I used to have some experience with uh, SAR images, uh, but it was only for a few months. And my experience was uh, like it's different world completely. It's it's not only about, uh, okay, here is a image and write a detector for that image. Uh, everything is different. Like the, you look at the image and you don't understand what you are looking at. So uh, I have the feeling that working with those images, maybe SARS are very specific, but aerial images per se, it's kind of like the craftsmanship. It's like if you try to apply techniques that work in any other domain, uh, you will maybe get something, but it will uh, for sure not be state of the art. Yeah, um, I totally agree, to be honest. And there's also a bunch of sort of sensor-specific tasks. So you mentioned SAR, Synthetic Aperture Radar. So there's quite specific pre-processing and uh, sort of techniques people apply to that imagery. So SAR imagery has this kind of speckle effect, which creates like a kind of basic interference patterns that you generally try and tidy up or handle somehow. So there's a whole bunch of you know work done just on removing those artifacts from that imagery before you can do things like segmentation or object detection on it so there are a bunch of quite specific techniques and approaches for remote sensing imagery which is you know one of the reasons why i thought it was useful to have a, a particular repository focused on those because you know you wouldn't necessarily be aware of that coming to that imagery for the first time and then again carrying on with the example of sar there's actually interesting approaches that people are taking so like trying to use uh, rules from you know our understanding of the physics to try and constrain the predictions of these models so there's you know a whole host of interesting applications and research being done on each of these uh, modalities yeah uh, there is also i mean i know that there are also some initiatives to artificially create uh those images because it's you know they they are being used if i, I remember correctly for things that are either slowly moving 
which means that they are basically don't move almost at all or are pretty big objects yeah so i know that people are trying to use uh you know rendering engines basically to create uh, artificial images over here which is not like very unusual approach in regular computer vision there are also companies who do that but the whole kind of like the process of making those images is completely different uh, i remember i spent like uh uh, a few hours before I even started to write computer vision models uh, for that use case to just understand uh, the, the domain, basically. And, and speaking of the computer vision models, do you use regular computer vision models, like the typical ones, I don't know, lately, let's call it YOLO, for example, or other models uh, for object detection? Or is the domain so different that you need to you know, come up with your own architectures or re-implement papers? Like, what, what's the process look like? So, I mean, I'd say, like, there's a spectrum, right? And there are people that, like myself, like, kind of more practitioners. And, you know, then there are people that are footing the other end of the spectrum, they're academic researchers, and they're focusing usually on, like, one particular technique, like, you know, change detection or time series for, like, crop identification, for example. Uh, myself, you know, being on the end of the spectrum or as a practitioner, I tend to use sort of vanilla, you know, uh, architectures. So I've been using YOLO V5 and started kicking the tires on YOLO V8. But object detection, that works just fine uh you know for segmentation you know the, the classic unit generally does quite well as a as a base a baseline model and again there are similar like you know vanilla approaches for classification problems so for the most part i'm using pretty standard architectures but you know sometimes you you know your requirements will take you out of the standard mm -hmm. stuff so for example if you wanted to do like i don't know uh yeah change detection right you might suddenly find that actually well mm -hmm. there's not a standard model for that that the entire community agrees on so let's go and have a look in uh, the literature and see you know which options are, are workable you know for my data set and how about those those uh, weirder use cases where you have for example uh images from two types of sensors looking at the same place I mean, I, 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 not my knowledge in terms of models uh, in computer vision doesn't really i mean like those that are ready out of the box to just use them i i don't recall anything that i could use for that so how do you handle those cases for example yeah that's what i would you know class as data fusion so fusing like multiple modalities and it could also include you know fusing like images with like sensor data mm -hmm. from the internet of things uh for example so there's some like kind of like easier approaches like if you're doing segmentation for example and you have you know sensor from like an optical and a, a SAR you can actually like pre-process the data and actually just treat them as channels in one like hypothetical super super sensor right and just like concatenate them and then there are other approaches where people sort of try and create embeddings of images right and train it in such a way that the embeddings are meaningful from the two modalities and then can be used for like a prediction task as well but uh, that is definitely an area that I see a lot of interest and a lot of activity uh, going on. And there's actually, I think it's actually one of the biggest sections of my repository as well about data fusion. Okay. Okay. Uh, oh, this is actually a pretty interesting angle. Like uh, if we talk about uh, aerial imaging, it is pretty broad topic. Obviously we have, I don't know, satellites, we have drones, we have different types of sensors uh, mounted on those platforms. Uh, where do you see, like, if I would jump right now into the field, for example, and I would like to, you know, learn something, uh, pick the topic that, in your opinion, will grow over the next, like, two, three years, what, what that would be? So one application I'm hearing a lot of demand for is, like, persistent monitoring. So, like, understanding how, a, uh, you know, a geography is being used or changed or, like, for example, are there changes, like, on a battlefield? Has there been a significant... You know, so long term and short term, yeah. Like uh, like I saw those Amazon rivers, for example, uh, images. That this is that th the stuff that you're talking about. Yeah. So understanding like changes over time mm -hmm. with the service, mm -hmm. right? And turning that into a service seems to be something people want to do. For example, there's a, like open source or freely accessible imagery coming from uh, European Space Agent Agency via mm -hmm. the Sentinel yeah, yeah. program, and anybody can create a you know a solution off of that. Uh, so the solution might be like let's monitor monitor like the growth of urban sprawl 
you know, in the developing world or try and identify like uh, illegal logging in the forest, right, and turn that into some some kind of service. So that's something that I see a lot of people trying to do. And I'll say if you're trying to build like a, a solution that can be live going forward, then you'd want to build it off some kind of data source that, you know, is reliably going to exist in the future. Um, so I, I remember the one use case that uh, I, I, it, I read about it back uh, like five years ago when I just started to work on computer vision and people were monitoring the levels of oils in, in those big tank containers that are somewhere in the Middle East mm -hmm. to understand how uh, prices of oil will change in upcoming weeks because, you know, mm. based on the demand and uh, how much they have, they can, you know, calculate the prices of oil. oil. So, uh, yeah, I, I guess the, the change uh, understanding, like you said, from aerial images, uh, the opportunities are endless, basically. <laughs> yeah, now, there's, whole, there's a whole industry in monitoring like ports and you know, oil refineries and things like that. And obviously it has like potentially massive impact if you're like trading some of those commodities as well. And I think historically it was done, send a man out with a clipboard and he would sit there with his telescope and watch these places. But now like, you know, it's common knowledge that you can, you know, visualize them from space. And like, if you're using, for example, SAR, you can like, you can get an image of the place every day at the same time and then quite accurately track changes so that that approach of the man with the binoculars is probably a bit expensive and doesn't necessarily scale to like monitoring the entire from what i heard those approaches based on satellite images are also not cheap uh, and all, only though like those like big players in on new york new york stock exchange can afford to have reports like that that come on a daily basis and give you like you know, precise information how many ships were in uh i don't know some specific ports on some specific mm, day yeah. and you can build some uh you know higher strategy for training uh trading based on that so yeah i mean like that's super cool uh, uh use case for sure anything more i think like disaster response is another area i see a lot of interest in you know we're there's so many different kinds of natural disaster and human like initiated disaster that are taking place and people need to rapidly uh, sort of assess the impact of like you know a flood or a fire right? and that historically again is something that's been done sort of quite manually but now is quite amenable to like machine learning approaches you know for example mm -hmm. like change detection or you know actually quantifying that, the amount of flood water in a place and you know obviously that kind of application could have a huge impact uh, you know human life at the end of the day so I think that's also another area that would be really interesting for somebody to get uh, to get started working on. Cool um are there any use cases that are still unsolved in in that space and something that people are actively working on or some problems that you know people are writing to you please help me out i'm trying to solve the problem and you say uh, there is no good solution for that and there's like Solutions for almost everything, but then, as you say, what's what's a good solution? And even if you take like you know flood water measurement, right? Even mm -hmm. like the last year or so, people have been running competitions on that because there are kind of solutions, but they're not necessarily I give you the accuracy that you. Because that's really another require. use case where you have a combination of computer vision and I guess if I want to quantify the amount of water, we talk about volume, yeah. And now I need to take into account the. The terrain that the right. water flooded yeah so right, right. that's why i say it, it's like it's a computer vision but it's not quite like computer vision because it's so much more that you need to do around data sets around modeling yeah yeah we're talking about computer vision as like the imaging photons of light right but of course you can have computer vision applied to point cloud data right you know it's mm -hmm. essentially like an image with slightly different like formatting and i think that's actually where like the, the machine learning side gets a bit more interesting like could you make a model right given like an aerial image from a camera and a an elevation of the land to actually you know predict you know regress the amount of flood water uh, in an image you know and potentially there's lots of techniques that can be done but they're quite manually or computationally intensive like for example like weather prediction is one of them like that uh, maybe um, you know machine learning could address those and that's something we're starting to see and you know give much more rapid you know answers about you know the state of what's going on in terms of you know wind speeds or floodwaters for example so i think even 
like machine learning is pushing into areas where we already have solutions which are good and accurate but not necessarily mm -hmm. you know perfect in all, in all ways i guess in in different areas we usually say that machine learning is a solution where it's as good as a human as doing something in those use cases that you you describe we be, we barely use like humans to solve that it's usually uh big computers like you say uh prediction of weather it's like it's like thousands of uh, data points tracked basically on a daily basis plus gigantic computers that are doing the predictions and we are yeah. still having uh, situations that you hear in the weather news that it will be raining and it's not or the other way around yeah yeah so are those models good enough to replace those solutions already or it's still still i think work i'm not an them? expert on that topic but i did see like a study and it was published recently it was like deep mind and uh, mm -hmm. i think it was um uk's like weather forecasting service and they basically want to do now casting which is basically where you forecast not tomorrow's weather but like what's happening in the next you know 10 30 15 minutes, minutes. Right? okay right and there you can't really like the simulations take too long to run even if they're accurate so you don't get that you know uh -huh. so you already you already you already know what the weather is because it's already that time that you're trying to simulate it 15 minutes ago so right. they cannot be faster than than the time that they try to yeah the simulation takes longer than the actual yeah time. it would take like a day to get an accurate simulation but you want the result in 15 minutes you might trade a bit <laughs> of accuracy for you know getting it quickly and that's where machine learning i think is starting to see uh it making inroads into some of those you know traditional applications cool okay um so next question is is about what you are doing right now so like we we can go back a little bit to the building of the community and and open sourcing stuff so you started with the repository and that was for the long time i guess your main activity yeah and right now uh i know that you created a youtube channel so what was the what was the reason to do that you just got bored or there is a well <laughs> you know YouTube is and videos is a really popular format for consuming, you know, information. And that what is the GitHub repository? It's information in a particular mm -hmm. format, but it's static, right? And you know, what I particularly wanted to do was to, you know, put a face to the names of the people working on some of the some of the projects that I was, you know, referencing in this repository, because mm -hmm. you know that would increase the impact that that work has. It would bring a new audience to it, and I think you know. So you this, basically this invite people that created part of those resources that you are talking about in the repo. That's, That's right. Yeah. This next so, level, instead of just reading about it, you get to hear from the source. Yeah. They say what, like a picture is worth a thousand words. So what is a video? It must be worth billions of words, right? Okay. And uh, and the plan is to uh, grow the channel to that size of of that repository. Well, we'll see how it goes. You know, I, I'm I've got a science background, and I believe in like running experiments and like you know looking at what the data tells you. And you mm -hmm. know, it looks like video, you know, is popular, right? And that's what I'm seeing. And ultimately, what I want to do is you know educate people and bring more people into this area, working on this kind of like imagery, because I think the problems people are working on are worthwhile problems ultimately. Uh, mm -hmm. So the repository itself, it got quite big and difficult, you know, for somebody to navigate. So I figured, okay, we need to find a different approach, right? And so this is why I started broadening yeah. out into yeah. different, different. I, I can also say that the younger generation, uh, uh, I myself, I, I'm not, you know, I, I'm 30, so I wouldn't count myself uh, as a part of that generation that I'm talking about. But for them, even for me, reading is like, you know, I would much rather prefer to just watch the video and learn this way than to read myself. So yeah, I guess it's a right, uh, right choice. And, you know, if you select the right guests uh, with interesting uh, things to say, uh, it may be even better. Mm -hmm. That's for sure. Uh, okay, so um, maybe let's also go a little bit into the tools that you are using. So I know that you are trying to use Roboflow to some extent. Um, what is the experience? Like I'm I'm hearing from you that data sets are completely different. So can you even can you even use like 
platform like this to yeah work with. so for many data sets they're not that different right so uh many of the data sets that i've been using recently have actually been you know taken from google earth imagery which is just obviously rgb high resolution mm -hmm. imagery and that's a really common format you know it's kind of easy to annotate because obviously we're used to looking at rgb imagery um mm -hmm. And yeah, people have created data sets. Creating a data set is a lot of work. I've done it a couple of times, you know, literally going from like raw imagery through to annotated imagery and curating all the labels and putting it somewhere and formatting the versions. And actually what RoboFlow does is provide a platform to do all parts of that and make it really uh, straightforward. And you can collaborate as well. So I've done projects where I've given some of the annotation work to you know, other people working on the project and uh, as a platform it really solves that data set creation and versioning problem i'd say in a more user-friendly way than other like platforms i've also experimented with um as i any mentioned future, before any future requests that we should uh, add <laughs> yeah well like i mentioned like not all images are rgb or even single channel but you know and there's different formats you know there's basically quite a tedious workflow sort of that's required where you get like these large geo tiffs that are like billions mm -hmm. of pixels and you have to like take them and like you know chip them up into little 256 by 256 and you know annotate each one and it's a bit tedious some people have created like um tools for annotating directly onto these geo tiffs which is not currently a functionality inside uh roboflow but you know i think it would make the platform more accessible to people that already have you know large collections of geotiffs for example and you mentioned that you created some uh, data sets in the past on your own are those in roboflow i know that you have some data sets over there so yeah i've got a couple in there um many of them were created in previous jobs so i don't i don't have mm -hmm. those anymore and they were in private okay. you know workspaces essentially but uh you know now that's something I'm starting to do. So, you know, you could put a data set on Kaggle. It's not great if you need to get in, you can't annotate an image, right? You can't yeah. create yeah. versions of that data set. And I've, I found that the ability to apply augmentations directly in the in the data set has been quite a convenience. You can do that, you know, in, in the training loop itself. But there's something quite nice about being able to visualize, you know, the augmentations that you've applied. So in your case, kind of like the data sets, because, you know, many people approach that topic differently. Uh, if you write a paper, you just create data set and your job is done. Yeah. In your case, it's like a living document. You go back over there, change stuff, add new images. Yeah, that's why I want to go to. Like, and I, I think you know another thing I want to get into, which is uh, it's sort of under the umbrella of what I'm trying to achieve, is to create like community mm -hmm. data sets. You know, because no data set is complete. You know, it's usually created by you know somebody for a specific purpose and right, and it might not have a, a global coverage, for example, like if you were talking about uh, trying to detect like houses, for example, obviously houses mm -hmm. and the way that they look in the community is going to vary a lot across the entire world. So across might different find... geographic regions, even. Yeah, yeah house, right. house in Norway looks completely different than house in Brazil, basically. Exactly. Right. So you train a model and you'd have it and it'd be great for Brazil, say, but then it wouldn't work for somewhere else but i see that in the future you know we'll have these community data sets which grow over time and will allow people either to do like pre-training let's say you want to make a really good model that would generalize to south south america for example you might mm -hmm. pre-train on like on a world data set and then fine tune on a more you know geographically you know limited uh data set right and produce a, a better solution in that way so i see there is a demand people talk about like foundational models where you you obviously need foundational data sets as well to complement those I mean, that sounds pretty exciting to to gather a community of people who were who would be so motivated to be part of the community so that they would spend their private time annotating that so i mean like for roboflow that sounds pretty exciting uh, as a person of the uh, group who will try to develop the community i would definitely like to see that happen mm. for sure um those people who do, the, do that those are people from your uh github repository who use that or i know there are re researchers who reach out to you and they already mentioned that they need something like this and you kind of like connect the dots in your head and okay we could we could do something together yeah so like many data sets are created either by like large organizations or governments like mm -hmm. there's so many created by like you know governments of china and america right but they only usually cover those specific countries 
Um, so you generally need a lot of people to create good data sets, I'd say, in some regards. You, st you still need like somebody to assess quality and, you know. Have exactly. That's another question that I have. Like if you have like 25 people and they all approach the topic of labeling in slightly different way yeah you get uh, a spaghetti of different annotations uh, mm -hmm. who you know which might be useful might may not be useful yeah and i feel like you know another idea i've had is about running like a hackathon so like a hackathon like you know people dive in there's a large un unannotated data set and at the end it's like covered by a license so anybody can use it you know, the thing about communities is, you know, they need some kind of focal point or some kind of direction to them. So that's slightly what I'm trying to, you know, do with my with my work and, uh, you know, try and give, you know, that focal point and then be that kind of ring, you know, cheerleader for specific mm -hmm. uh, activities as well. The, the moment that you uh, started to talk about those, you know, community driven data set, I, I saw the 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 flash in your eyes it was like you know that's something that excited you really is there mm. anything else that you have on your plate on your list for upcoming year or two or three that you would like to develop as a as a project around satellite images or maybe not not necessarily yeah i mean i've got a few projects i'm working on several things at the same time so that i've got a newsletter uh, i've just started like a discord channel because i you know i figured I want to Everybody have like has a Discord. A Even I have a Discord channel right, right now. Yeah. Yeah. It's a lot to learn with all of these things. And, you know, unlike you, you know, I kind of, I'm getting into things for the first time and there's a bit of a learning curve to it. And uh, I feel like, you know, I want to focus on one thing at a time to make sure the quality, the quality mm -hmm. is there. And if it's, if it's not the right direction to go in, then you need to like, you know, yeah, find, cut, you know, cut how it, you yeah, and, and focus on things. And, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Exactly. I can, I can, uh, uh, you know, say that I have, a, a similar experience i started like so many different things that at some point you barely have a time to to maintain that and you like you say if you want to develop and have the high quality then you need to pick your poison basically yeah. and the rest it's it's done yeah. well what i'm what i'm hoping to do by fostering community is to enable other communities to you know develop within it and it could be like you know, MSc students that are all working on mm -hmm. similar projects find each other via Discord and, you know, help each other or collaborate on something like and create these opportunities for these. So like, that it would work in slightly asynchronous way. You no longer would need to foster that topic on your own. You would yeah. have kind of like this organically uh, growing community. Yeah. And I've seen that in other projects that I've been involved in. So I've been involved in like home automation for a while. And there's a mm -hmm. project called Home Assistant. And I'd say mm -hmm. part of the reason for its success, I think it's actually like the number one repository on Python and GitHub actually last year or something. It's super really popular. I, I need to Google project. that. Yeah. You do. Yeah. And I've got some vision projects that I did in that context as well. But anyway, what they've done really well is, you know, use the community, right? So if you're talking about open source code, right? What is the community there? Well, it's the contributors mm -hmm. to the code base. It's the people that are, you know, providing YouTube videos on how to use it. And, you know, once you get that community engaged in the sort of production of, you know, content process, then the community itself could be more so self-sustaining and go in directions that, you know, an individual doesn't have the bandwidth to, to go in. Exactly. I mean, like that's like an ultimate goal for somebody who is trying to build uh, the community. Is that at some point you can just take your hands off and just watch it grow and focus maybe yeah. on some things that are interesting to you that's uh, personally. Yeah. But the whole project is moving forward. Yeah. That's right. Because even like something like you know GitHub repository, right? It's it's you know work essentially. There's only so many hours that you know I have free in the week to work on these things. So the more I can get other people like to you know help with the routine maintenance of that or you know, suggest improvements to it the more that it's a sustainable activity and is that happening like people are submitting prs to that repository and you know a looking few. for those looking for those resources for you so you don't need yeah. to do it i mean yeah i've had a couple of like contributors to it i don't know what the reason is why some repositories get more contributors than other maybe it's like seems daunting or the people that are using that repository and starring it are not necessarily people that contribute you know to github regularly but i you know recently for example the the change that i made to uh the sort of the way that data is presented in the repository was suggested in an issue uh by mm -hmm. somebody that is obviously using this you know for their mm -hmm. own use as well so mm -hmm. you know little bits and pieces 
Um, I'm hoping that with like the Discord, then I'll see more conversations going. I get like personally, I get like a lot of messages from people that are like want to get into this field, and they got uh, you know many of the similar sort of questions like where do I find you know introductory content or you know can you point me to data set and such and such. And ideally, I want to create a place where these people can go and like help themselves, like as you say, so I can like focus on you know, specific things that I want to work up on. Great. Okay. Uh... We already are at the time that we originally uh, um, decided uh, we will uh, talk through. Uh, I mean, but I'm still happy to talk if you have uh, any topic that is uh, interesting to you uh, and we still didn't cover. It. I know that there is a newsletter. Uh, so if you want to talk about that, we can for sure do. Yeah, uh, so I've been publishing a... More. A newsletter mm -hmm. on basically the interesting stuff that I find. You know, I was previously like putting this out on Twitter and LinkedIn, but you know, a newsletter is quite a good format to aggregate information, and you, know, you don't have to check it every day, for example. So, please. By the way, how many people are uh, sub uh, subscribed to that uh, newsletter? At the moment, it's about two thousand three hundred and something, but it's, it's sort of doubled in like a month or two. So, it's, it's really it's, it's obviously oh. a really popular. <laughs> topic okay. I'm trying to work on the search engine optimization to drive more traffic there um so i've got that I've those got... numbers are also kind of like sorry for interrupting those numbers are, are also kind of like hard to assess because you know when people here are you know two thousand people uh but when you think about how narrow the topic is uh compared to you know i don't know sports newsletter everybody is interested in sport how many mm. people are interested in earlier images yeah so mm. Uh, I, you know, I was surprised. It's a respectable number, 2,000 people yeah. reading uh, what you want to say about aerial images. Congrats. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, um, I don't know who those people are, which is like one of the drawbacks of a newsletter, right? You, you know that <laughs> yeah. you've got subscribers, you don't know. One-way communication, yeah. Yeah, and that's why I'm like hoping with the Discord I can actually get like more direct connection with, with people and, you know, get some idea. Because obviously you need to know who your audience is to produce, you know, material that will, will benefit them. Sure thing. Um, you could like run surveys in newsletter, but again, not, not, not too many people, you know, actually do those. Um, but yeah, as a platform, I'm on this Substack platform and they're improving the way that you can get insights and statistics on, you know, where your audience is. So many of them are in North America, for example, uh, not so many in Asia and Africa. So you need to do a bit of work there to, to reach. I guess know, so. I guess so. My projects are mostly uh, used in Asia, like Korea, Japan. Oh, well, China. that's really interesting yeah. in itself, isn't it? Like, Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm not really sure. And, you know, I my projects are also in computer vision space. Uh, it's just a little bit broader topic, maybe. Not uh, mm. as, uh, you know, as precise as yours. But yeah, I would definitely say that you need to, that's an unexploited niche. There is a lot of people who are interested uh, in your work for sure. Mm. So maybe, uh, maybe, oh, I saw something like that. Yolv8 is doing a version of their repository in Chinese. Maybe you can do something yeah. like this. That's yeah, cool obviously all my posts thing. are in English. So that immediately. Yeah, know, and that creates a barrier for things. everybody who is not English speaker. Yeah, uh, maybe that's an idea. That's yeah, a I lot mean, of work on the other hand, but what I would hope is that AI comes to the rescue and like does good translations of my of my Chat posts to other languages. Well, yeah, that would be fantastic. Like if the browser, you know, changed, you know, to your language. I, I guess it I need to be. test that whether or not it can it can work as as well because in that case it's not only about translating the content. You just paste the markdown file and you know say translate it for me so yeah yeah and then imagine if you could go onto discord and have conversations with people and their native language is something completely different but it was like you know doing the translation in real seamless time. seamless conversation in the written form it's it's pretty much possible you know because you know, yeah in, when we talk it's a little bit different yeah but in the written, i know that there are already some tools for discord using uh the GPT algorithm. So yeah, well, I'm quite I'm quite open to experimenting. So people in the community have good ideas. Like how do we broaden access to this information? And it's I'm the kind of person that will just try it. Like particularly if you look at like remote sensing, it's got quite an academic, you know, audience in many regards, mm -hmm. and they they prefer to do things in the traditional kind of ways. So I think it's as you mentioned in the start, you know, you want to appeal to a broader audience. You need to be experimental in the platforms and 
you know the channels that you use to communicate so yeah working on uh, the newsletter i'm also hoping to get a course off the ground so this will be uh, basically a web web course so you can go on and okay lessons okay. in different topics like object detection on aerial imagery and uh, data fusion for example on some specific for... platform or your own website well it's actually all hosted on github it's just marked down that's then it turned into a static website and then you know mm, okay. github pages yeah, yeah, yeah. to present I know, it I know the technology, yeah. so mm -hmm. uh, that's the idea uh i've got like a dozen chapters that are basically placeholders waiting for people to come along with content by the way the course will be free or paid it will be free like my approach is to make information free and then if you do want to monetize it you make that on your you know your time or some like premium product off top of it respect respect you know i i know so many people in computer vision space who just try to monetize literally everything that they do yeah so uh, yeah i have a lot of respect for people who spend their own time creating stuff for others and and don't expect money for that pretty cool depends on your strategy because you can go you know monetize everything put it behind a paywall but then you're going to get far fewer people you know through the door to begin with whereas everything's open then you get before, a much you, bigger before audience. you've even proven that you have some value to show you already exactly. stop people from using that because you're yeah sustainable. Yeah, so that that's another conversation that I'm, yeah. I'm happy to have, but I'm not really sure if that, it, you know, still that half of that uh, interview is mostly about building the community and growing mm. uh, your your GitHub and other platforms. So uh, I guess we didn't really talk as much uh, about the aerial images, but about other useful things as well. Uh, yeah, links, by the way, links to all your all your resources will be visible in the description of the video. So whomever is still with us at the end of the uh, of the conversation, uh, make sure to check it out, especially if you're just starting to considering moving to computer vision space or a real imaging space, that's a perfect place to start. It was a pleasure. It was uh, an honor to, to speak with you. Uh, and thank you very much for being uh, here with us. Well, thank you. I hope we get to catch up again sometime.